I'm really happy that uh, we have Dr. Anil Seth uh, today. Uh, Anil has uh, a couple of masters uh, from Cambridge and from Sussex, as well as a PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence, um, again from, from Sussex. He is currently the professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience and at University of Sussex, as well as the co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness, as well as the co-director of CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Uh, he is extremely active and very well known for his research on consciousness and is the editor-in-chief of the uh, journal Neuroscience of Consciousness, which is the, um, the journal for the uh, sort of the most visible conference uh, in, the, uh, in the field, which is the Association of, of um, Consciousness Studies. Uh, Anil is really well published. He was the highly cited researcher for 2019 and 2020, um, according to Web of Science. And his talk, TED Talk from 2017, has been viewed over uh, 50 million times or, or something at this point. Uh, <laughs> it's a really topic. entertaining talk. I, I highly recommend it. Um, so we're really, really glad to have him here. Uh, Anil, take it away. Thank you, Dobby. It's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, this cartoon thing that I've started with is actually a cartoon that was drawn. Somebody saw the, the TED Talk and drew it, and I actually, I, I really like it. So I just wanted to squeeze it in there somehow. Um, okay, so I, I, I gather I've got about 40 minutes. I, I, in thinking about what to talk about today, Rather than diving into one specific thing, I thought I would try and just give a bit of a an overview of a variety of different things we're doing. And we can always dive into specific things if we have time and the questions a little bit later. So it's a bit of a trade-off between breadth and depth, and I, I hope that that's okay. So what I want to do is firstly say very quickly my general approach to uh, studying consciousness through cognitive uh, neuroscience. Um, and then touch on three different aspects of this general strategy, conscious level, conscious content, and conscious self. And then finish with a few more speculative thoughts about uh, how really what I think consciousness is all, is all about in the sense of its connection to our nature as, as living machines, beast machines. Okay, and this is all sort of slightly by way of of advertising. I'm, I've finally written a book which is coming out in September in the UK. I think it should be shortly after in the US. I, we, we haven't quite finalized, but um, the proofs are being done now. So it should be October, I think, in the US. So if any of this hits you as interesting, there's more about everything. And it's a trade book, but hopefully it's interesting also. It's trying to hit that middle ground where it's interesting for people in the field as well. Okay. So the general approach is I kind of caricature it as the real problem approach to consciousness. And this is, of course, in contrast to David Chalmers here and his hard problem. Now, I think you will be familiar, but I'll just very, this is the only quote I'll read. It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. So for Ch this is the hard problem, right? How does anything in the material physical world give rise to or be identical with any kind of conscious experience? Um, he distinguishes it, of course, from the easy problems, which are, the dif which are very difficult to solve, but of course, as we know, are defined by the fact that there's no conceptual mystery that a mechanistic or physical solution could exist. So these are typically thought of as the problems, functional problems, in the vicinity of consciousness, but that don't necessarily have anything to do with um, subjective experience per se. So that's usually the distinction that's drawn. The reason I pick out this kind of middle ground called the real problem is because I don't think it's, I think the dichotomy between easy and hard problems is just a very unproductive way to think about how to do consciousness science. So the real problem, which I think many of us actually do, I think you guys do it as well, and Chalmers calls it the mapping problem. How can mechanisms and processes in the brain and body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness, functional and critically phenomenological? So this is, it's not, it's not ignoring consciousness like the easy problem tends to do, and it's also not going 
after the big scary mystery itself about how and why consciousness is part of the universe saying okay consciousness exists it has properties they're functional and they're critically their properties of what experiences are like at the level of their descriptions as experiences how can we relate those to mechanisms that's what science does we can do that with consciousness too um it's a, it's maybe metaphysically unsatisfying to some people but the hope is and again this is an imperfect parallel and much overused but it's a historical parallel that a similar sense of mystery accompanied life not that long ago people thought oh life is too can't be explained by physics and chemistry we need a an elan vital a spark of life oh no we don't. life has a bunch of properties we can account for them all we still don't understand how a cell works but there's no conceptual mystery that life is continuous with our physical natural picture of nature don't know whether the same will happen with consciousness but it might this is the approach to dissolving rather than solving the hard problem okay I mean, I'd normally say more about that but I'm not going to because I think I want to get onto actual stuff and talk about level content and self so the level stuff is a bit oh I've used the wrong slide here level should have stayed and the rest disappeared anyway it doesn't matter um when we think about conscious level the way I'm using the term here as this continuum roughly continuum although really it's multi-dimensional between coma anesthesia sleep drowsiness all the way to conscious wakefulness possibly beyond uh, so global states of consciousness would be another way to think about it um, and so it's it's people uh, Tim Bain has written a nice paper showing that you better to think of this as not just a single dimension but for now I just wanted to portray it that way to contrast it with wakefulness and the idea that conscious level is not the same as physiological wakefulness or arousal you can go off the diagonal in both directions you can have conscious experiences while you're asleep as when we dream uh, and you can go through sleep wake cycles while having no conscious experiences as in the vegetative state and that's enough to show that although they may normally correlate in some sense they're not the same thing and so what we want to you know, we're thinking about conscious level so what in the brain is going on that counts for conscious level per se uh, so here rather than summarizing the whole literature on this the approach we've been taking is looking at signal diversity so this is roughly the idea that measures of complexity broadly speaking in the brain are potential useful biomarkers or correlates of conscious level this theoretically inherits from in my case it was really from reading Edelman and Tononi back in 1998 these first ideas that connected consciousness with complexity and then it becomes from there a case of well how do we operationalize and measure that and it turns out that a quite a robust measure of complexity is signal diversity and this is this is not this is a bit of a it's a very brute approximation to complexity because really it's a measure of how random a process is rather than how complex it is um, but we can get into that later it's a measure so we, what one very popular way to measure signal diversity is the lempels of complexity I won't go through the, the details here but the basic idea is for any time series you can find a minimum description length for that time series the shortest time series that you would need in order to regenerate the original so for something completely predictable the lempels of complexity is minimal um, it's like if it's all ones you just say one times n for a completely random time series the lempels of complexity is maximum you have to specify everything in its individual place and somewhere in the between is somewhere in between so it's exactly the algorithm or varieties of this algorithm are used to compress images into their into their most compressible files and so this is why it's a measure of, of diversity rather than complexity per se but it turns out to be quite a useful uh, marker and just to summarize a range of studies we've done using um, this lentils of complexity this is with Michael Shartner former PhD student and Adam Barrett uh, we see that the complexity decreases systematically here with levels of sedation in general anesthesia this was using EEG data in quite an early study uh, we also see uh, systematic changes in complexity in different sleep states this was with intracranial EEG data in a collaboration with Samini's lab um, and what's interesting here is that we had electrodes in four different 
lobes, broadly speaking, across patients. And um, we, we compared waking rest with both REM, non-REM sleep and with REM sleep. And what you can see immediately here is that REM sleep is basically the same as waking rest. So complexity levels in terms of lempel zith are the same in REM when you're more likely to be dreaming and having conscious experiences than when you are, let's say, especially in early non-REM sleep, which is the state of sleep that's least likely to generate dream or conscious reports. So here's something that suggests it's tracking conscious level rather than physiological arousal here. It's also something we've never really followed up. It's high, higher in the frontal areas always, no matter what sleep. I still don't know whether that's a, this particular patient cohort or what's going on, but um, still an, an observation to dig into further. The last study to summarize here was one we did applying to MEG data in collaboration with uh, the group of Robin Carhart Harris in London, who have been pioneering research uh, in psychedelics. And what we found here was super interesting and actually at the time unexpected, which was an increase in signal diversity and complexity in the psychedelic state, this resting psychedelic state compared to wakeful rest or, or a placebo condition. And this was true, this, this particular plot I'm showing is for LSD. It was also true for psilocybin and low doses of ketamine and for DMT, uh, which another group, well, uh, found out. This was kind of cool because up until then we'd been, what we'd been actually looking for situations where this measure of diversity went above baseline, hadn't found it in any other uh, situation. Showing people complex movies didn't seem to work, stimuli, paying attention, didn't see, maybe you know, too subtle, but in any case, here we see a very clear and robust indication that the, the brain activity becomes systematically more diverse in the psychedelic state, which you could argue very roughly corresponds to the, the more freewheeling nature of perceptual experience in the psychedelic state, though this is a very broad uh, association, sure. Beyond complexity, and this is staying with the psychedelics for, for a moment, with Lionel Barnett, a mathematician in, in the group, we've worked for a long time together on things like Granger causality. We wanted to know what would happen to information flow between regions in the brain, in the psychedelic state. And so here, what we did with the same source localized MEG, this is uh, across subjects, we, we, can, we looked at the three psychedelics plus another a substance called tiagabine as a control, which is just a, in this, it's an anti-epileptic drug, so it's a, it's a GABA agonist, um, has no psychedelic effects, just the important thing we wanted, it just, we could compare it to placebo. And so what we found, we measured, just very briefly, correlation or mutual information between each pair of sources, and we measured Granger causality, and, and Granger causality is very roughly directed information flow. You can think of it as directed correlation between two time series. And what was quite fascinating here is that if you just look at the LSD, correlation goes up. So each red bit here is the average correlation between a source and the rest and the other sources. And so general, general redness means really the brain is becoming more synchronous over, under the LSD effect. But lower Granger causality. And this was kind of interesting because we didn't predict a dissociation between these two quantities um, in advance. And we were wondering, you know, is this a trivial consequence or is it, you know, and that's, mathematically they actually can move independently. There's no reason to think that they ought to go together or they ought to not go together. In this case, they, for LSD, they anti-correlate. For psilocybin ketamine, the robust result is a decrease in information flow. It's very unclear what's going on with correlation. Interestingly, in tiagabine, more just because it shows that it's a, it's not a trivial thing, everything goes up. So correlation goes up and Granger causality goes up. So it's not just a sort of trivial consequence of looking at, at dynamics through two different lenses. They can move in different ways and they do move in different ways. So for me, this take home thing here is that, so just as with the lempel ziv, we tended to see an increase in signal diversity. Here we see a decrease in information flow, not information sharing, but information flow uh, between regions in the psychedelic state. Again, very roughly in line with the idea of a disorganization of, of perceptual experience in, in psychedelia. 
what we're hoping to do very soon is, is just do the same stuff with anesthesia and sleep as well and other global states of consciousness to see what happens. We haven't got the data for that yet. Okay. Oh, last thing on, um, why is that working? Oh, it's working the wrong way around. Apologies. This is a bit hard to see. One thing we're working on now, just as a sort of teaser, is using stroboscopic lights to induce visual hallucinations, mainly because we don't have license to give people psychedelics. So we want to find other ways to induce weird visual hallucinations. So if people expose themselves to very strong stroboscopic lights at about between 3 and 10 hertz with their eyes closed, you will have visual hallucinations. This is extremely robust and extremely interesting. And we're both looking at EEG responses here. It's a bit tricky because we're driving the brain very strongly at a rhythm. Um, here, so you get a lot of entrainment. And just this thing at the bottom right, we're also trying to figure out interesting new ways where people can report different kinds of uh, hallucinatory experience. So we have a software engineer building what we're calling the Cluvinator, which is basically a way of, of combining Kluver forms in different combinations so people can twiddle the knobs and come up with a a bit like dry, doing a caricature when you, you're in a police station or something <laughs> you're trying to describe somebody you can kind of use this to get close to a visual depiction of what your experience was like rather than or in addition to a, a verbal report so this is still very much ongoing stuff okay so i said this would be a high level overview that's all i'm going to say about level and then move on to content and the way I think about conscious content uh, is quite you know, common to many people, I think, is as a process of inference. So it's the old idea, this is a slide from the TED thing, that uh, perception is not a readout of sensory signals. We don't just open our eyes and read out the world objectively. Uh, sensory signals are noisy and unlabeled and ambiguous, and perception is always a process of inference about the causes of the sensory signals and the contention here which is you know, goes back to Kant, uh, Helmholtz in psychology and many others since is that perceptual content is this is the result of this inferential process it's the brain's best guess of the sensory signals I think the, the sort of radical claim here is that if there is one is that priors and expectations don't just shape what we see they are what we see and it's difficult to experimentally tease that apart, but I, you know, ideally that's what I would like uh, to, you know, to take as a testable hypothesis, this distinction between shaping and constituting what we see. In any case, these days, we, this whole idea of perception as inference is, of course, framed in things like predictive coding and predictive processing, for which the core idea is that predictions flow in a top-down direction, uh, that... Um, convey predictions about activity at the level below or about activity at the sensory surface and prediction errors uh, flow in a bottom-up or outside-in direction so those are the sensory signals and now the prediction errors and through a continuous process of prediction error minimization this is a way for the brain to implement Bayesian inference on the causes of sensory signals and then the, the idea is well what we actually you can you can then use this to say well what in this process is associated with the content of our experience. Is it the prediction error? Is it the joint content of the predictions? And so on. So my hypothesis again would be that it's the it's the content of the predictions across levels. Um, so yes, perceptual content conveyed by top-down predictions, bottom-up sensory signals convey uh, prediction errors in this thing. Of course, it's going to be more complicated than that. Uh, one thing just to, I don't have a slide, but just to mention, one of the things we're working on are these hybrid predictive coding schemes where predictions flow in both directions and prediction errors flow in both directions. And this is actually kind of a powerful machine learning algorithm, but it also may be interesting to map it onto perceptual dynamics in the brain. Um, just sort of context thing. When thinking about predictive processing and, con and consciousness, point I always like to make is that predictive processing is not a theory of consciousness. It's not, it's not telling you what systems are conscious and what aren't, and it's not like integrated information theory giving you necessary and sufficient conditions for consciousness. It's rather a general theory of perception and action and cognition and other things. But I think this is really powerful because it, it, it's, it can be used to explain properties of phenomenology, why certain experiences are the way they are, 
in terms of mechanisms in exactly this real problem sense without making claims about what is conscious and what is not. So this, this plays into this larger thing about theories of consciousness and how to compare them. It's very difficult because they're all theories of different things. Um, IIT is a theory of consciousness. Predictive processing is not, for instance. Um, so we make this point with Yakupov. I just wanted to point out there's a nice new journal called Philosophy and Mind Sciences um, that have a, a range of papers very recently about the relationship between predictive processing and, and consciousness. Um, okay, but we can do experiments under this kind of frame. This is an old experiment with Yaya Pinto when he was in the lab. For instance, uh, one prediction that you make very quickly is that we see uh, if, if perceptual content is conveyed by predictions, then you should perceive what you expect or what the brain expects more quickly and more accurately than what violates those expectations. So this was an early experiment where we tested this in continuous flash suppression, which is, um, you know, has issues, continuous flash suppression, but we did a lot of controls in this one at least and showed that indeed images break through into conscious awareness more quickly and they're identified um, more accurately, um, or sorry, it's both two different tasks, detection and identification, but they're both accelerated when the person is cued to expect the, when the expect the cue is valid. So in this case, expectations accelerate conscious access. Really, this is a test of conscious access, not really phenomenology. Um, two experiments. This is the first time I've put slides about these things, and I wanted to mention because these are much more recent studies that we're doing to sort of extend this a little bit. So with Ryan Scott and and Lena Scora, this has just come out uh, this month. A study where we wanted to think not only about expectations that are sort of passive, like it's going to be a house or a face, but sensory motor expectations that couple perception to action. So what we did here was have a training phase, a conditioning phase, where people were trained to respond with one or on a left or right hand or one or other key um, to different kinds of images. Um, that, that belong to different classes. So they're abstract shapes, but they were in different classes. So they were trained to recognize these, this, these different classes of shape and associate an, a specific response with each class. And then what we could do was ask whether, uh, under, again, CFS, whether um, if, a, if the response they were using was congruent to the shape that was suppressed, would they be faster? Um, so would would, there, would breakthrough now be accelerated by a sort of valid sensory motor prediction rather than just a, a, sense, a prediction about the content? And uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail, but the answer is basically just about yes. It's, uh, it wasn't the strongest result, but again, CFS is not great at that. But um, over two experiments, congruent sensory motor predictions accelerated breakthrough. You can, you can sort of see that, especially in experiment two, the dark blue uh, bar is, um, is shorter than the incongruent one. Um, oddly, if you do no, if you associate no action, that's somewhere in the middle, which is, which is strange. Anyhow, that was, that's one thing that, so we did is generalizing this idea of expectations and conscious access. The last thing I wanted to say here is, um, with Maxine Sherman, who I know W you know, and, and uh, others in the group too. We've been working on a sort of not, now more a higher level kind of expectation. So this is something uh, that's been called self-efficacy. There's an old history in psychology about self-efficacy. It's basically how good do you think you are at a task uh, rather than what is the stimulus going to be? And so what we, we were interested was well, what effect does can we manipulate self-efficacy and what effect does that have in perceptual decision tasks? So again, trying to explain a long experiment in, in 30 seconds, um, what Maxine did here was uh, a perceptual decision task, which is just random dots with, with directions, but they, they uh, can be objectively and difficult or easy. So the, dots are the level of coherence determines two difficulty levels for the tasks. And then they can appear in difficult or easy blocks. So there can be a block where easy trials are more likely and a block where difficult trials are more likely. And within each block, there are difficult and easy trials. 
in this particular experiment, there was a bunch of other experiments. This was one of the experiments we did where it was actually also a dual task thing. So you can see there's a little green and, and uh, red disc, and there's a classic task here where you want to say, is it um, which is the more luminant part of that disc? What we found, just to cut the long story very short, is in that J at the bottom, people get better at the uh, distractor task, at the dual task, um, in the easy blocks. So when they believe the task is easy, they perform just as well at the easy t at each task objectively, and their confidence is actually matched. So their performance on the random dot task is just the same, but they do better at the distractor task. In other words, multitasking is easier if you believe you're doing well at the primary task. That doesn't have to affect your performance on the primary task. So it's as if it, this sort of validates this belief that, well, if you feel that a task is, if you feel like you're doing well, then you've got kind of more uh, resources to allocate to a distracted task. And that can be done independently of how actually you are doing at the task, which is kind of interesting. So that's, uh, there's other stuff there, but I don't want to get too much into the weeds and I want to continually rattle through um, other things that we've done. And now we get a bit closer to phenomenology. Like, how do we use this framework to explain what an experience is like? And, and one of the things we've worked on here is this sort of idea that visual experience is a kind of, uh, you know, we experience things as objects. So Magritte played with this in his famous painting here. So what does it mean to experience something as an object? So we had this idea that you will experience something as having objecthood if it responds to your actions in a in a sort of predictable way. So we this is based on sensory motor contingency theory from 20 years ago, Noe and O'Regan. And now we used augmented reality to develop a bunch of virtual objects that either behaved according to expectations or behaved in very weird ways when you interacted with them. So we could do this with augmented reality. And then we again, sorry, this is the last continuous flash suppression experiment. I'm not going to show any more, but we, we had a setup with CFS in augmented reality so that now, again, a little bit like that experiment with Lena, objects would be suppressed, but they would behave under suppression either congruently with your actions or incongruently with your actions. Um, and what again we found is that we did it in two ways, with just rotations and with more freeform movements using a phantom thing. It's again a mess, bit messy, but uh, it's sort of it would like to do this again. But the indicate we did see effects that when the object responded to your actions, when there was a contingency, it didn't have to be uh, the right contingency. When there was a contingency compared to when you're just replaying trials, it broke through more quickly from CFS. Um, this data, yeah, it works, but I, I do admit I, I am less, I wouldn't sell my house on this because CFS in, in augmented reality is, is pretty messy. Uh, but it's sort of indicative, I think, that there is something going on here that objects that respond to your actions again um, are sort of easier to see in, in, these, in these situations. Okay, moving on. Now I want to talk about a bit more phenomenology, but how do we use this framework of predictive processing to look at unusual uh, phenomena such as hallucinations? We all see faces in clouds and in buildings. And this is an approach I've begun to call computational phenomenology or computational neurophenomenology, the use of computational models to model specifically phenomenal properties of, of things. And so the, this classic thing, you will have probably seen this in the, I mean, this is a classic feed forward neural network. If you run it backwards uh, and fix dog in the output, you get uh, these weird deep dream, Google deep dream types of images. This is something we did a few years ago where we did the Google deep dream on a panoramic video of Sussex. And what's happening here is that we process every frame of the movie through uh, this inverted classification network so that it's projecting the ex prediction of dog into the image at every frame. And I still find this quite fascinating. It's, it's kind of fun, but it's also fascinating because uh, it's really capturing quite a distinctive kind of phenomenology. There's nothing functional being modeled here. It's modeling a weird way in which experiences might seem, and the dogs are not 
photoshopped onto the image. They're sort of coming out of it in what might be kind of a psychedelic-ish way. I mean, that's how it might be described. Uh, so we call this the hallucination machine more as a demonstration than anything else. And what we're trying to do now is take that, oops, skip that, is take that further and see if we can use a more flexible architecture to map out the diversity of different kinds of visual hallucinations. So for instance, we hallucinations vary in their complexity, whether they're simple patterns or complete objects, how realistic they are compared to your normal perceptions of the world, whether they're spontaneous or not, and whether they're experienced as being part of the world or not. And so with uh, Kesuke Suzuki and David Schwartzman and our student Alec Chance, we're using now these coupled discriminator and generator networks that we actually adapted from Nagoyan and colleagues' work, um, where now you've got a similar discriminator network that is like the previous one that classifies images and you can run it forwards to classify or backwards in a deep dream way. But there's also a generator network. The purpose of that is to try and basically regenerate whatever input it's given. So it's trying to auto encode uh, the latent variables necessary to regenerate any given image. And if you couple and modify and manipulate these in different ways, you can generate different kinds of simulated hallucination. So if you, for instance, run both the generator and the discriminator together, you can generate complex hallucinations. Here there's just a series of images showing on the left column if you start with an input image and on the right is where you end up. So a volcano turns into a lamp and so on. It doesn't just become random. Um, if you simulate visual loss, you can ablate part of the input and start to simulate the kinds of hallucinations you might expect to get as a result of visual loss in things like Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, and you can also turn down the generator network and start to simulate, as we had before, things that are a bit more complex or simple psychedelic hallucinations. So this is still just exploring the space of the kinds of imagery that these networks can generate. And we're now trying to close the loop at all. This just shows the this um, what happens over iteration. So you can sort of see the process in which a network transforms an input into an output, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is still just very much ongoing stuff. Uh, what we're now doing is coupling these with interviews of patient groups that have these kinds of hallucinations with Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, typically have complex hallucinations, Charles Bonnet, simple ones. And we're also showing them various representations of the output of the model so they can pick what aspects of the model, what parameter spaces within the model best uh, describe their experiences of hallucinations. So that way we might be able to actually do a kind of computational differential diagnosis of different kinds of visual hallucination. Again, still ongoing. Uh, we've used similar networks to look at time perception, and this is work with Warwick Roseboom. You know, we have experiences of duration, things last particular amounts of time. And you know, classically, this is thought of in terms of a, uh, an internal clock. But with Warwick now for years, we've been thinking about time perception really as an inference of the rate of change of perceptual information rather than the ticking of an internal clock. And so in a study from a couple of years ago now, what, what we did was showed people just various movies which had different amounts of things happening at different levels of abstraction. So a movie of a field, a movie of an office, a movie of a busy city scene. People would judge the duration of these movies. We'd also show the same movies to a feed forward network, the same deep network that we used in the hallucination machine. And we extracted activity from three different layers of this, four, three or four different layers of this network, and just at an adaptive uh, threshold at which it would identify something has changed. And the sum of these changes over time were combined and regressed to estimate, so that the network came up with an estimation of duration of the movie based on the amount of change across levels in the movie. So it's, we're extracting a duration purely based on sort of sensory input that undergoes perceptual processing here. And what was interesting here is that the model matches very nicely to human reports, especially in the, so you see here, of course, longer movies are rated as longer. What's interesting is the bias. So shorter reports, shorter movies are 
overestimated and longer movies are underestimated. This is Vierat's law in, in, in time perception. It's a regression to the mean. And you see exactly the same thing in the model, especially when we restrict the model to where people are looking. So that's the gaze model. So we can extract pretty well duration reports just based on a perceptual model of, well, a model of perceptual processing of the visual input. And again, with Maxine, what we've now done is take this into the into the scanner and uh, just compared office and city scenes where uh, people tend to have different biases compared to the, nor the normative duration in offices versus cities, because in offices, nothing happens. So people um, underestimate the duration. Cities, lots of things happen. People overestimate the duration. People still do this when we showed them the videos in the scanner. The network does this in B, you can see below, the same network I just showed you. And then critically, we, we took extracted activity from the visual cortex, as well as auditory and somatosensory as controls, and basically treated the activity from the visual cortex as, as activity from the model to see whether it would do the same thing, and it did. So visual, so this just reassures us that the actual visual cortex is operating in a similar way to our model when it comes to how we use that activity to extract time perception. And it wasn't the case for the auditory of the somatosensory models. So it's not just neural activity. There's something about the perceptual processing of the stimuli that allows us to recover duration. Okay, that's time. Um, so I've got about, how, I've, I've about run out of time, haven't I now, Adobe? I still wanted to say something about self. Have I got 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah go so. for it. Yeah, go for it. Okay, good, right. Self. Um, oh yeah, just take, this is brilliant. I just have to show you this for 30 seconds. This is a clip from True Detective, which captures everything you need to know about the self. Too self-aware. Nature, aspect of nature, separate from itself. We are creatures that should not exist by natural law. Well, that sounds god fucking awful, Rush. We are things labor under the illusion of having a self. This accretion of sensory experience and feeling. Program with total assurance that we are each somebody. But in fact, everybody's nobody. I wouldn't go around spouting that shit out with you. People around here think that way. All right, sorry, I love that. I love that kind of, I don't know if you could hear the audio, but to me that, that sort of captures the self as an illusion argument perfectly. So uh, the basic idea here is that the self is not the thing that does the perceiving, the self is another kind of perception. So this is a sort of old, pretty well-established idea now. But exactly how does that play out? So let me give you just one example. Um, and don't worry, this is this will go somewhere. It's like this is a very familiar example of the idea that the experience of the self, in this case, the experience of the body, is a perceptual best guess. So here we have the famous rubber hand illusion. So in the rubber hand illusion, as I'm sure you all know, you have a real hand being stroked and a fake hand being stroked, and the stroking is simultaneous. And the person is looking at the fake hand. It's always funny. And the, um, and the idea is that the congruence between seeing touch on a fake hand and feeling touch on your real hand is enough that the brain makes its best guess that the fake hand is in fact part of the body. That's the usual story told about the, the rubber hand illusion. So yes, perception of self in this sense is, is another Bayesian best guess. But the story is in fact much more interesting and complicated than that. The first thing is that Everybody knows the rubber hand illusion is not massively convincing. It's not like the phantom limb or somatoparaphrenia where people really believe that their, you know, their limbs, their, their status of embodiment has changed. It's subjectively weak compared to that, and it's highly variable across people. So what accounts for that variability? Yeah, multisensory integration. In accounting for that variability, with Peter Lush and Zoltan Dienes primarily, we wondered what top-down factors might affect the variance in reports of the rubber hand illusion. So we did the rubber hand illusion on over 350 or so people um, 
a couple of years ago. And we also measured their trait suggestibility. This is how roughly how hypnotizable they are. And this is again like consciousness is a tricky word. Hypnosis also has a huge amount of unnecessary historical baggage that we should just not worry too much about. Suggestibility is a reliable trait. Um, it's a stable individual trait about how the extent to which people can generate perceptual experiences in response to suggestions. And what Pete found was that there's a very strong correlation between suggestibility and uh, response to the rubber hand illusion. So you can see that's the arrow here. The more hypnotizable someone is, the more strongly they report ownership of the rubber hand in the uh, when it's being stroked synchronously. Now, they also still report a big difference between synchronous and asynchronous stroking in all levels of hypnotizability. So that you could say, well, that difference is still always there. So the rubber hand illusion is still working. But as Pete showed in a separate study, people have very, very different expectations for what they should ex experience when the hands are being stroked synchronously compared to asynchronously. When the hands are being stroked, if you just describe the experiment to people and say, well, what do you expect to feel? People expect to feel more ownership in the synchronous condition than the asynchronous condition. What this means is that the rubber hand illusion is very uncontrolled when it comes to demand characteristics. The, synch the asynchronous condition is not a valid control because people expect to experience something different. And if they're highly suggestible, well, you know, that's that. That's then g given they have different expectations, then you'll still expect differences uh, at all levels of hypnotizability. So this, I think, is is kind of interesting. On the one hand, it's been quite contentiously received in the community of people doing rubber hand based research, because the argument is you need to take into account individual differences in suggestibility and worry about demand characteristics. In fact, we've had this long argument with people summarizing a, a blog post in, this, in a preprint that there's this strong message that a lot of the work using rubber hand illusions are not controlled for demand characteristics and don't necessarily say anything about multisensory integration. Uh, on the other hand, this is a very powerful method because we can now use individual differences to understand how perceptual experiences are generated in a kind of top-down way, comparing high and low suggestibility people. And it's not just the rubber hand illusion and vicarious pain, the tendency to experience pain when you see a movie of somebody in pain. That also correlates with uh, suggestibility, as does mirror synesthesia. And now we're extending this to look at a whole range of other perceptual effects, like the McGurk effect, which is an integration between audio and visual um, signals. And people, it affects people's auditory perception of speech. Um, so this is, I think, an exciting line of work and one thing we're just doing now is, is coming up with new ways to measure individual suggestibility or what we call phenomenological control. One of the issues is the word hypnosis, as I mentioned, puts a lot of people off and may cause people to respond differently. So we're, we're showing that you can measure this trait of ability to generate experience in response to suggestion totally outside of the hypnotic context and using questionnaire scales and other scales that don't mention hypnosis at all. And this is just showing, like, we, we just did this on two groups of people. And um, the phenomenological control scale is also uh, reliable. And, but it has, in fact, if anything, higher mean values than a standard hypnosis scale. OK, look, I'm, I want to, it's, it's five o'clock, so I'm going to just take two minutes. And I ran out of time, I'm afraid. The last thing I was really talking about was just very speculative, no, no experiments, just this idea that we don't only experience the body from uh, as an object, as in the rubber hand illusion, we experience it from within as well. And this is where interoception, this perception of the body from within, comes into the story. And I've been thinking about this process for a while now, also as, a, as an example of predictive perception, as, as in this case, interoceptive inference, where the brain is making its best guess of the prediction of the state of the internal state of the body causes of interoceptive signals. Uh, it's just the same, formally, it's the same problem of, of inference. But there's an interesting difference, which is that this interoceptive inference is not about finding out what's there. It exemplifies what we might call active inference. It's all about control and regulation of the body. 
instrumental rather than epistemic. Uh, the brain perceives the interior of the body to keep it alive and not to figure out where it is, to put it very bluntly. This has a long history of ideas in cybernetics, the idea that any good, reg if you think of the brain primarily as a regulator of the body, that's what brains are for, keeping the body alive. Every good regulator of a system must be a predictive model of that system once you exceed any minimal level of complexity. And that's what interest, for me, that's what interoceptive perception is all about. It's the regulation of essential physiological variables. And in, this means that it has, suggests why, for instance, visual experiences are different from, let's say, emotional experiences. Visual predictions underpin visual perceptual experience because the first approximation, they're about finding out where things are and how they're moving. Uh, interoceptive predictions are not about where things are, what shape they are, they're about how well things are going, which is why emotional experiences have the character of valence rather than shape or color. Uh, hard to test that, but this is why I call this speculative, but to me it's, it shows at least the utility of thinking about conscious experiences in terms of predictions. Different kinds of predictions give rise to different kinds of experience. And most speculatively, this goes all the way through. If you think the primary purpose of the brain is to keep the body alive, well, that there I think you find these deepest levels of embodied selfhood that are not the body as an object, it's this sense of being a living organism that is basically just a sense of how well the brain is doing at keeping the body going. Maybe lost in conditions like Cotard syndrome where people believe themselves to be dead. And all the rest follows. If that's the primary purpose of brains in all of our perceptual experiences, whether they're of the self or the world, all have their roots. They're all grounded in this biological drive to stay alive, in the, predict, in the imperative for the brain to regulate, predictively regulate the body. So this is the slogan that we perceive the world around us and ourselves within it, with, through and because of our living bodies. So consciousness in this case becomes very close to life, not just this historical analogy now, but there's a real continuity in this view about how our conscious experiences are bound up with our with our living nature, the necessity of the brain to, to maintain our physiological integrity. And this is where, just to finish now, this is where the title of the talk comes in. Descartes, as well as splitting the, the universe into mind and matter stuff, he also thought that life and mind were not really related to each other. He thought he had famously denied rational conscious minds to non-human animals, arguing that without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals are unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. Um, he had a pet dog, actually, so I'm not quite sure how much to really believe that. But I think the opposite is, is the true. It's the opposite, that um, conscious selfhood emerges because of and not in spite of our beast machine nature, that it's because you know, we can't understand the nature of perception, of the, certainly of the self and maybe of the world, except in light of the brain's role in maintaining the physiological integrity of the organism. Okay, sorry, I, I now will finish. The real problem is a pragmatic approach to consciousness science. We can think of conscious content. I think now by using computational models of phenomenolo phenomenology rather than just function or access. Uh, talked about self and highlighted the role of phenomenological control or suggestibility in shaping experiences of self. This, has, of course, has a lot of clinical implications too. And then finally, the somatic roots of selfhood and all consciousness in our nature as beast machines. So I want to thank people in the lab that have contributed to the work. And just in the last 30 seconds, mention I'm also involved in this foundation which started last year. If, you're an er if you are or know of early career researchers interested in the interface between neuroscience and mental health, we provide three annual awards of 100,000 unrestricted research funds and a $20,000 prize, cash prize, well, salary prize basically, salary bonus uh, for proposals to do innovative ideas with high impact potential in this area. It's set up by this guy I got to know who's a, he's a sort of young philanthropist who's very keen to make a difference in this area and I'm sort of impressed with how it's going. Last year we we had three inaugural uh, fellows, all American. It's open to uh, candidates in America, Canada, and the UK at the moment. Um, and short applications, which are due in April with a uh, closing date sometime in May. So if you're interested in that, 
Um, these all tend to be at the moment sort of assistant professor level people we've been funding, but it's, it's, it's flexible. Okay, I will stop. Thank you for uh, allowing me to run over a little bit. And uh, thanks for the invitation again. Happy, if we've got any time for questions, I'm very happy to take them, but I assume we might be out of time. Any other, maybe a quick applause from me and Bilal and whoever else wants to unmute. So I think we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so, so Jacob Billings uh, wrote a, a few things. Uh, Jacob, maybe if you want to unmute and, and ask a, ask your question, um, I don't want to try to piece together for you. Hey, sure. Uh, this is just uh, to follow up on this notion of um, complexity and measures of complexity changing across the states of the brain. It'd be interesting to think about how during adolescence, individuals are undergoing synaptic pruning and um, consciously we start to um, cement, you know, crystallize into our uh, personality. Um, from the various possibilities that we might pursue, um, whether these measures of complexity might be seen um, during this time frame, might also be interesting to think about how long-range connections tend to stabilize during this the same period, and whether or not uh, you know functional and perhaps even structural measures of modularity uh, might similarly be found to be more uh, richly diverse pre-adolescence than afterwards as the brain is sort of cemented into um, a set of expectations about the self and about the external world. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. It's very, so one of, I think one of the things that strikes out that's challenging about doing that, I mean, of course, there's many different indices one might apply to track neural development over you know, from childhood into adolescence and so on. Um, plenty of things we know change, as you mentioned, there's a lot of myelination, development of the frontal cortex, so on. The issue with measuring something like levels of complexity is that it's, it's, it's much more difficult to interpret like across time diachronically rather than in the same brain across different conditions. We don't really have a, you know, a good baseline. So, um, so many things might be changing that it would be quite difficult to interpret a change in that one index. Um, partly that's just because it's a very blunt index. I, I think so, something more interesting might be that you, you might indeed see things like changes in functional connectivity between anatomically widely separated areas that could be more interpretable i think across the developmental period and just also just thinking phenomenologically you're saying that yeah we, you sort of settle into a a personality as you as you grow up reminds me actually of um so alison gotnick is a philosopher in, in berkeley has talked a lot about infancy and she's quite well known for describing or hypothesizing that the infant experience is rather like a psychedelic experience. So it's not its not really just uh, the, the lack of personality. There's something, in, at least in her mind and her work, um, and it, that's a bit speculative, that that would be the perceptual universe of the infants would be not dissimilar to an adult psychedelic experience. And so that's that would give you a hypothesis to maybe think that some of the signatures that you would see in an adult psychedelic state might be recapitulated in in a infant's brain dynamics you wouldn't give the infant psychedelics that would be a different thing altogether but yes interesting but challenging to to get an empirical handle on it's much easier for these for these kinds of measures which are which are relatively uh subtle it's it's like even with the perturbation complexity index that marcella massimini uses which is which is more i think uh robust in the sense that you, you're giving a perturbation looking at the response to the perturbations. They compare patients with different levels of, of brain injury 
um, and that seems to work, but you you know you can get this this value out. But it's in general, it's a really hard challenge to go from interpreting a within subject difference to interpreting between subject differences or, or longitudinal differences across. So it sounds like we need better measures of that, and um, the conditions are are there to to generate these changes. Um, but we just need some better measures of the of the systems processes. Yep. Uh, Dieter has a question. Yes, uh, so I, I'm a cerebellar scientist, and uh, the cerebellum is kind of highlighted as a predictive controller, uh, yeah. maybe the, the organ in the brain that does the most accurate predictions on our actions. But we, we're generally thinking that we're absolutely unaware and unconscious of cerebellar processing. So I was wondering how that works together. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of you're absolutely right, right? So the cerebellum is largely thought of as as a I and mean, you know much better than, than than me. Obviously, it's it's. I was always impressed by the work of Jerry Heslau, who I know has done a lot of stuff on on the cerebellum. Um, but it also seems to be true that that the cerebellum does not directly underpin conscious experiences. It's not to say it doesn't shape it. Uh, but you know, the few examples we know, and I don't know if you know of any others, there are a couple of examples of cerebellar agenesis or cerebellar lesion that don't seem to impact um, conscious status in these people uh, very much at all. It's it's un, it's really to me it's I, I don't know really what to say about the cerebellum. I think it's 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 Whatever predictive modeling is doing, it's not. It doesn't seem to be the predictive modeling that's shaping our perceptual experience, at least not not directly. Is that because is that a property of the the low level wiring of the cerebellum that there are lots of relatively independent circuits um, compared to compared to cortex? I'm I'm really yeah I'm not I'm not sure. I mean it's obviously it's it's a bit more distant from sensory input, but Right, but it does suggest that just doing predictions isn't quite uh, good enough uh, to qualify for consciousness. You, you need something uh, in addition that we may not have yet completely quantified. Yes, I completely agree, which is why I was careful to say that. Um, sorry, somebody's uh, always careful to say that predictive coding is not a theory of consciousness. It's right. certainly, I, I would, yeah, I think this is true even outside the cerebellum. There's predictions going on in the retina. I mean, this is the first examples of predictive coding were were thought of in the in the in the retina. And um, no, there's it's not that any kind of neurally implemented prediction is sufficient for conscious experience. No, my take is more: uh, can we use that framework to understand the phenomenology of conscious perception where it does appear? And it becomes an, an interesting empirical question, which to the extent that we can describe neural operations as predictive, which, which ones are associated with conscious content? Is it a matter of hierarchical level? Is it a matter of temporal depth? Is it a matter of modality? Is it a matter of an anatomical location? I think these are all open questions. All right, thanks. A really quick, maybe last question here. Um, so you, you talked about the level, the the content, and, and the self, um, mm. and you talked about them pretty much independently of each other. So mm. I'm wondering, do you do you think this relationships there? Uh, for example, do you need to reach a particular level of consciousness before you can get specific content, um, or you know, in the end, those I'm assuming evolution like created one thing, and we can uh, figure out different aspects of it, but it's not like three different things there. Yes, I, I yes, I use those terms just heuristically, not pretending they're independent. I mean, self you could definitely say is a subset of content. Mm -hmm. um, it's just for me, it's worth thinking about. You know, in fact, although the argument is that's really based on the same underlying processes of of of, you, know, you can understand experiences of selfhood 
as distinct kinds of predictions in the same way that I can understand visual auditory experiences. It picks out a class of phenomena, explanatory targets that I think are worth grouping together as, as distinct. And then level, yeah, is, again, is not, not independent. And in fact, the work with psychedelics is an interesting example of where it becomes unclear whether we're dealing with a different global state or a, just a very different collection of local states. Uh, and ultimately, differences in level are constituted by, by differences in, in content. But, but again, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're just, it makes sense to ask to group the questions differently. So you can group sleep, coma, anesthesia, but no, they're not, they're not different natural kinds at all. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Aniel, again. Uh, that, that was a, that was a great talk. I, I really enjoyed it. And I think um, everybody else here did as well. I just want to remind you, you have a, a, a meeting with the graduate students, which starts in about yep. eight minutes. Um, okay. And I'll I'll also see you later today. Uh, looking forward to that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I know I've got a schedule, so I'll um yeah I well I'll I'll just take a quick break and I'll be I'll be back. I don't have to stay on I stay on the same line, do I? I think it's a different link. Okay, I'll look at my schedule and make sure I do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, right. But, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you again for the invite. Thanks for thank you for Anil. listening that to was the great. very scattered overview. Of <laughs> Lots of different stuff. Great. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure. So thanks a lot. I'll be back soon. <laughs>